talk today at prayer meeting. We we gave prayer requests, and of course we, Brother Morris, had, like I said, he he stood up and brought a challenge um, to us about our country and the condition of it. And uh, am I on now, Brother Patrick? Am I okay? Okay. About the condition of it, and you know we're. Um, I mean, it's. You can take two opinions about it or two approaches. One of them is you can treat it like doomsday, uh, chicken little, the sky's falling, we're all in a mess, we're all in trouble. Or you can look at it as an opportunity to be a bright light shining in a dark place. And we are in a dark place right now. But throughout the Bible, uh, I remember... When I first started pastoring in 1978, one of the first sermons I ever preached, I remember I used to have those W. Herschel Ford sermon outline books. I preached a boatload of those sermon outlines. And he had one in there, I remember. And all, I didn't preach the sermon, but I borrowed the title, Bright Lights Shining in Dark Places. And you know, I want to say number one, thank you to all of you that are here. You are the backbone of this church. Uh, some of you or all of you have worked today one way or the other. You've battled the devil in hell since Sunday. Uh, you've gotten some bad news. You've had some heartache and heartbreak. So when I preach, and Brother Jesse does too, I want to be a blessing to you. And, and especially on Wednesday nights um, when I was a layman, going to Peachtree Road Baptist Church years ago for three years. I was working three or four jobs, and I remember coming in there on Wednesday night so tired, so drained, been fighting hell, being out there in the world for three days, and I really needed something from the Lord. So I'm going to try to do that tonight. Um, we can be, we can take this as... Again, doomsday, the sky's falling, we're in a mess, we can't do anything. I mean, has the pandemic affected America? Sure it has. Has it hurt our church some? Sure it has. It's hurt every church. Uh, I talk to pastors almost every day. And what I hear back almost every time is we've held our own, but we're not where we were. And we're trying to get back up now. And that's what I think we're all trying to do. We're, we're, we're wading through a maze that has been a maze for over a year now that we had never been through before. And, but the Bible says a lot of things about God protecting us and about God taking care of us. When the, when the pandemic first came last year, I remember that I preached a message out of Psalm 91, which I believe Psalm 91 is probably one of the best passages to think about during this pandemic. Matter of fact, I don't know if you've seen them or not, but I've seen yard signs with Psalm 91 on it, red and white yard signs that said Psalm 91. It's a wonderful psalm. It talks about the protection of God. And, you know, I think, I think my thought tonight is, Two things. Number one, God said we're going to be fine. Did y'all hear that? I think I'll say it again. God said that we're going to be fine. I, I'm teaching through the book of Philippians uh, in Sunday school. Now give me, Miss Vicki, give me Philippians 1, verse number 6, if you will. This is one of my favorite verses in the entire Bible. And the reason it is, is if you look at it, for what it's saying, it's just such a blessing. It says here, being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the, until the day of Jesus Christ. Now, now, that's a promise from God, Brother John. That's not a promise from me or you. That's not a promise from your daddy or mama. That's God saying. God said... I started something in you, and I'll finish it in you. 
And then you think about in the Bible, and I'm not going to preach on this actually, but this is just a little mini sermon kind of like. You think of in the Bible of the men that like Joseph that was given the dream in Genesis 37 uh, where, God, where God showed him a dream that one day he would be in authority and his brothers would be bowing to him. But you know what happened to him after that. I mean, his brothers put him in the pit. Then they sold him to the Ishmaelite. How many of you don't, how many of y'all know how the devil works? How many of y'all believe while he was in that pit, the devil probably came to him and said, oh, 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 big boy, where's that dream at now? Hey, big boy. And then probably when he got put down in Egypt and Potiphar's wife lied on him and accused him of raping when he didn't do it and they put him in prison. I can just imagine the devil now probably him sitting in that prison for those years that he spent there and he spent years there. He didn't spend days there and get bailed out. He spent years there. And I can just imagine the devil in his flesh saying, yeah, where's that dream at? that God gave you in Genesis 37. But the good story about this is the dream did come true exactly as God said it would. And God did exactly, exactly, exactly what he said he would do. And, and church, the main thing we've got to hold on to now uh, I, I, listen, I can watch Fox News or Newsmax or whatever, and I can get depressed. I can get upset. I can get mad. I mean, I, do, I get mad sometimes and want to want to shoot somebody or something, you know. But I can also just say, Lord, you promised to take care of me. Lord, you promised to bring me through this. Lord, you promised to use me. And that's what you've got to do. You've got to be confident in Him, not in yourself, not in the circumstances, not in the happenings. That's why there's such a difference in happiness and joy because happiness is determined by the happenings. Joy is not determined by the happenings. I mean, you can have joy, joy, joy down in your heart when hell, hell, hell is breaking loose. And that's the amazing thing. I, I mean, I, I remember... I remember when I was a boy, and it wasn't a big fire. It didn't burn the whole thing down or nothing. But Daddy had a business, and he had built a little lean-to, pretty big lean-to, out the back of it. And one night we got a call at the house, and the fire department was around there. And, and I reckon somebody had started a fire, or one of the dryers or something, and shorted out. It, it was a pretty good little fire, and... It burnt down, not the whole lean to, but it burnt down a good bit of it and did, did, a, did a good bit of damage. But I remember Daddy standing in the little champ parking lot and I remember him looking at me and saying, but you're okay and I'm okay and your mama's okay and Eddie's okay. We can build another building. And I've always remembered that. And he wasn't, I'm not sure Daddy was even saved then. But he just said, we can build another building. We've got life. And you know, I just, I, I'm just so tired of the negativity. I'm so tired of, and I'll be honest with you, church, and, and some of them may be watching right now. I'll tell you something that shocked me, Brother John. They, some people use this pandemic as an excuse to get out of church. They've used it, buddy, and they've jumped on it. And some of them staying with it. I got news for you. That's the time to get in the church. I mean, that's the time you need the fellowship. That's the time to me you need what God does to you or whatever and for you in the service. But just think about that. God, I mean, Brother Tony Santa Minette started as a little ugly bus kid and now he's a little ugly 23-year-old. But he's going to make it. I promise you he is. You know why he's going to make it? Because of God. See, God said, I will perform it. I will finish what I've started. And I believe Grace Baptist Church gets the same promise. What God has started and what he's already done, God can do it again. I mean, I, church, you know, I know some of y'all looked at me funny a while ago. Some of y'all said 200 people. We had not had that many in a while. Well, we, we can 
How many of y'all believe we can? I mean, how many of y'all believe you bring a few people, get, get some family members and get some friends and some prodigals and get, get everybody, anybody with a breath in their body to come? And what if a bunch of them came that day and what if some of them got saved? Amen? Wouldn't that be a blessing? See, I mean, we could be like New Jersey. New Jersey has not been able to have services hardly for a year. California. You look what they've done to them out there. They're having to meet in the parking lots. They're having, they can't even meet in the churches or whatever. We're not there. Start getting so down. And we've been able to meet right here since it started last year. Now, we chose to, we chose to shut it down a few weeks. And we chose to shut it down another time. And I still think that was the right move. I think that was the right wise move. Some churches didn't do it and they're proud of that fact. I don't care. That don't bother me. I'm not worried one bit about what you did or didn't do. I believe we did what we should have done. And I believe we made the right decisions. But as a whole, it was us making it. I mean, we, uh, us pastors had a conference with Governor Kemp and you know what Governor Kemp said? He didn't tell one of us not to have church. He didn't tell one of us not to. He said, matter of fact, his words were, if I can't trust you guys, who can I trust? But I would ask you, as your governor, not to have church for a few weeks. Now, how could I just kind of be arrogant and say, <laughs> Forget it, buddy. <laughs> God, we're going to do it anyway. God has blessed us. God has been good to us. He's allowed us to have a governor and be in a state that has allowed us to have church. That they're even allowing it. Do you realize one state said that you could have church but you couldn't sing? They couldn't even go in the auditorium and sing. I mean, could you imagine going to church and they're telling you you can't? See, we've not been with that. God's been good to us. We've got the opportunity to reach a lot of people. We've had the opportunity since last year. And God wants to work in this thing. And God wants to save souls. See, I, I believe this church, I believe right now that we have a truth. I believe we have an answer that they don't have. I mean, I've talked to unsaved, unchurched people. They don't have an answer. They're scared to death, some of them. Some of them are petrified and just live in fear during this time. But we've got an answer. Jesus Christ is the answer. The Word of God is the answer. The promises of God, as Brother Jesse preached a few weeks ago, are the answer. It's the promises of God. Call unto me. I'm going to tell you all something. You don't think a lot about it maybe, but that Wednesday noon prayer meeting that 10, 11 people come to, and be honest with you, church, it's the same ones. We're sitting there today, matter of fact, eating and having fellowship, and uh, Miss Mary Snodgrass didn't mean nothing negative. She said, I sure wish some other people would come. And I said, well, I do too. But I thank God for the 10 of you that are here. And they're here every Wednesday. And we meet and we fellowship and we give prayer requests and we pray. And it's just a special time. I mean, I'm telling you, Wednesday has became one of my favorite days. Because I look forward to seeing you, Brother Jim and Miss Gail. I look forward to seeing you, Brother John Hurd. I look forward to seeing the ones that are coming. I mean, it's just a blessing to see and fellowship and pray and everything. We have that right. God's been good to us. But I believe that prayer meeting is going to make a difference. Because this church is never going to go any farther than we get off our knees. I can promise you. I, I was reading Reese Howells, the intercessor, and he made a statement that really jumped at me. He, you know, Reese Howells, if you never read it, he was raised in an affluent family, uh, and he really got a burden for poor people and the tramps and the outcasts and the homeless. And he, he started living like them. See, back in their days, I, I'd like this personally, they ate four meals a day, not three. 
they ate, they ate four meals. They ate a breakfast uh, between six and seven normally. They ate what they call where we get the idea of brunch from. It, it was a breakfast combination lunch at about 11. Then they ate an afternoon meal. Then they ate in the evening. I like that personally. I mean, I've been doing it for years anyway. wasn't supposed to. But, but what happened was the, the homeless people and the tramps and the ones at the coal miners that he was trying to reach, they only ate twice a day. They only ate six and seven in the morning, five and six in the evening. So he started doing that. He just cut out the other two meals. And his mom, of course, didn't understand it. And his daddy said, son, you're, you're, you're going off the deep end here. I mean, you know, you, you, nutrition-wise, you need these meals. And, and he would do things like uh, he would give them his money and he'd work all day in the coal mines and then, then go at night. And do, but what was funny one day, his dad said to him, his dad said to him, two, two statements I like in this same chapter. His dad said, he walked all the way across in the rain one night, Brother John. He walked about seven, eight miles in the rain. Not one of these stories like we've told through the years, uphill, downhill, all that. He walked seven to eight miles in a driving rain. And he got there at nine o'clock. Now this is after, by the way, he had worked 10 hours in a coal mine. Are you listening to me? He had worked 10 hours in a coal mine. He changed clothes, walked seven to eight miles to just preach for 30 minutes. When he got home past midnight, his daddy reprimanded him and said, Reese, you're losing your mind. He said, no, daddy, I'm doing what the Lord's telling me to do. He said, Reese, I wouldn't have walked across there for $20. And Reese said, I wouldn't have either, daddy. I didn't walk across there for $20. I walked across there for the tramps that needed the gospel. And then his dad said, you and these tramps, Reese, you and these homeless people, you and these coal miners, I mean, they're, they're the dregs of England, of, of Wales, or wherever you go, Wales. And he said, but Dad, I believe my love for Jesus is never any more than my love for the, the least one that he died for. Did you hear that? See, we've got a chance, church, to make a difference, to be a bright light in a dark place. We've got the truth right now. We've got the gospel of Jesus Christ. I mean, I was going to read to you here again. I preached on this months ago, but I go back to this all the time. But in Psalm 21, the Bible says, in verse 10, it says, Their fruit shall... Their fruit shalt thou destroy from the earth and their seed from among the children of men, for they intended evil against thee. Now, church, say what you want to. I've been, I'm 66, okay? It's been politics for 50 years, Chris. It ain't that no more. It's evil. It's malicious intent. It's to hurt people. It's to drag people down now. It's not about being Republican or Democrat now. It's not like it was 30 years ago. It's about hurting you. They're telling people to confront people. They're telling people to get aggressive in their face. They're attacking people in restaurants for their political positions. That's what's happening right here. Church, they intend evil against us. Do you hear me? And that's where God is saying to Israel, He said, for they intend evil against you. They imagined a mischievous device. That means meanness. That means negativity. Something to hurt. Something to cause a problem. A mischievous device. Boy, do I love this. Which they are not able to perform. See, if we, had a, if we had a map up here of the world, if we could act like we do now, and if I was showing you with a telestrator, and I was showing you the Middle East, and that screen was the, that screen was the picture we were using, you would see a large area, and you'd see large bodies of water there, and you'll see a little country about that big. It'd be about that big. Matter of fact, the size 
of New Jersey is Israel. Did you know that? They're not a big country at all. And all of a sudden, all the hell hates them. And all of a sudden, everybody has worried about that little two-by-four pipsqueak of a country sitting there. Why are they so worried about me? Think about it. Why are they so worried about it? Why are they worried more about Iran? Why are they worried more about Iraq, Turkey, countries that are bigger, stronger, more dangerous? I can tell you why. Because they're God's people. And they hate God. And they imagine evil mischief against Israel. But I got news for you, church. God said he was going to take care of them. Matter of fact, God gave a promise and said, I will bless thee that bless thee and curse them that curse thee. These Democrats and whoever else is with them better get on Israel's side, you hear me? Because when you're on the other side from God, you're on the wrong side. I don't care how many allies you have. How strong is God? God took one angel, one angel, angel and killed 185,000 Syrians. Do you realize one angel, Brother John, killed twice the population of Athens of soldiers? One angel. How many angels do we have? Well, the Bible says clearly that one third got kicked out of heaven. I like what one preacher said. That means we got a two to one in the good guys there. See, for every, for every demon, for every fallen angel, there's, a, there's two good ones. For every one that walked away from God, there's two that stayed with him. So for every one that's against you, this is good. So I'm even getting, I'm enjoying my own preaching right now. I really am right now. Just let me do it for a minute. You know, for every one that's against you, two's for you. Huh? So we're going to be fine. Because God said we are. But let's take this time and let's shine. Let's be a bright light. I mean, they talked about the coal miners. I've been reading the book, Reese Howells, and, and so I've read a lot about his work in the coal mines. And, you know, in coal mines, I've never been in one. Has anybody here ever been in a coal mine? I've never been in a real coal mine. Okay, well... I didn't think you had probably, but I thought somebody might have. They say it is so dark when there's no light in a, in, a, in, a, in a coal mine that you literally, Brother Chris, can put your hand right here and not see it. They say it's one of the darkest places in the world. But all you have to do is cut a light on. One little light lightens up the cave. One little light shows you where to go next. That's what we can be, church. Let's stop having the muddy grubs. Let's stop, you, you know, I'm not going to beat you up. I promise you, I'm not, I have no desire to beat you up and, and get on to you or nothing. I, I, have a, I have a desire to encourage you to let's be lights. Let's be different. Let the world see Jesus. And what did Jesus say? Jesus said, it was it Matthew? I, I didn't write it down. Uh, yeah, 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 Matthew. Uh, give me, Vicky. I, I think I'm right. Give me Matthew 5, 16. I think I am. I might not be. I'm an old man. I can forget real easy, to be honest with you. Let your light so shine before men. Watch this. That they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. How many people were you just kind to today? How many people did you just speak nicely to? I went in, uh, we had lunch, prayer luncheon at 12 o'clock, and I called about 10 o'clock and talked to a young girl and I said, I'm going to need 24 pieces of fried chicken. 
uh, and I'm going to pick them up about 10 minutes to 12. She said, okay. Well, basically she forgot to tell them. So I got there, I got there about a quarter to 12, matter of fact. Remember, somebody sent me a little text. I got it this afternoon. 1144, three families are here. Where are you? I was down there doing my job, praise the Lord. But I walked in, I walked in, and I walked up to the counter there, and I said, I'm, I'm Ed Strickland, pastor of Grace Baptist Church, pastor of Meredith Grace Baptist Church. I'm supposed to pick up 24 pieces of fried chicken. Well, the, the lady looked at me and kind of went, we don't know nothing about that, sir. And I said, well, I called here about 10 o'clock and went through this or that, and she finally uh, went in the back and asked them, said, do y'all have some chicken ready for Grace Baptist Church? And the, the cook said, and it wasn't the cook's fault, said, no, we don't have any. We just sent a group out for the buffet up there. So she came back out and said, sir, you must have called another store or something. No, I said, I call this store. I get, I, get, I get the fried chicken here every time we have a prayer luncheon or whatever. And that lady named Sharon spoke up, the little girl. Uh, yeah, I forgot to tell y'all. Well, and I told all that to tell you this. I was sitting there at the, at the counter, and the girl really got stressed out because she, she's a pretty new employee, evidently. And boy, she went to apologizing, you know, and she, she left behind the thing, walked over to me and, and tapped me on the shoulder and said, Sir, I'm really embarrassed and I'm sorry. And, you know, I, but I just said, you know, ma'am, it's no big deal. I mean, we can just wait a little bit. We can get fresh fried chicken. We'll be fine. And the Lord, it's, it's like the Lord just said to me, just, just be real kind to her. Do we think that away very much? Because, see, here's what happens. When you're kind to somebody, and you're kind of like a light shining in darkness, they want to know why you're that away. Well, there, there's your chance to tell them about Jesus. I'm this away because Jesus saved my soul. I'm this away because I believe the Lord's in control. I mean, it's opening doors everywhere if you'll take them. There's a lot of people out there, church. I'm almost through. There's a lot of people out there that are hurting real bad right now. And they don't have any answers. And some of them have lost family members and they've lost friends. And some of them have lost their jobs. Some of them have lost their businesses. I mean, it's really been a hard, I mean, 2020 was a hard, hard year on everybody. But why don't we decide to be different? Why don't we decide to be, well, we made it through it. And 21 is going to be better. How many of y'all believe that? I believe 21 is going to be better. I believe it already has been. But I don't think we've seen nothing yet to what God can do. And, and no matter what their evil, mischievous devices and all it don't they can try whatever they want to try god said i've the bible said i've never seen the righteous forsaken nor his seed begging bread god said that i mean goshen was right here and egypt was right here it wasn't 10 miles apart, church. It was right next to each other. And there was darkness here and light here. There were murrain and balls here and nothing here. There was lightning and hell here and nothing here. You know why? Because God's people was here. So let's just try to be a bright light in a dark place. You are already by being here. See, your testimony of being here on Wednesday night, everybody rides up and down Highway 53, sees your cars and trucks out there. And don't let them kid you. They know why you're here. Don't let them kid you. And they know they should be here or they should be somewhere in the house of God tonight. So see, you're already being a bright light by being here tonight. The ones that they had prayer meeting was already a bright light by being there. The ones here at Sunday school will be a bright light Sunday morning. You can be a bright light so many ways. So many ways. I mean, so many ways. 
I close with this. I went to Dr. Hancock uh, last Monday, and he checked my shoulder. And, of course, it's just going to be a long, long, long haul. And he's told me time and time again it's just going to be a long time. And I'm not a patient person. Did you know that by now? And I'm, I'm, it's, it's driving me crazy. But he told me to go see the doctor, too, about my hip. Here's what I want to bring up to you. The doctor looked at my hip, my x-ray, and he came back, and he had my medical records. And he said, blood clot in your lungs and colon cancer and heart failure and blood clots in your lung again and hip replacement and blood clots in your lung a third time. Uh, Knee, knee surgery, uh, hospitalization for heart fibrillation or whatever. And he said to me, he said, and your accident last August, I mean, broke back, broke shoulder, broke hip. And he kind of looked at me and he kind of went, his name Dr. Walker, and he said, how you made it through all that? And I said, Jesus, that's it. See, I don't live there anymore. But every day I rode by that side of that road brother Jim every day church it didn't mean nothing to you some of y'all ain't worried about it a bit and I don't care if you are or not but every time I rode by that mound and I remembered what happened there and I realized it was almighty God that said no I'm not through with him and that's how we have to look at this it's an opportunity to be a bright light in a dark place. Amen? That's it. Reckon that's it. Hope you got a blessing out of it. Thank you for being here. Thank you for coming. Try to be here at Sunday school Sunday morning. I'll be teaching in Philippians again. I'll start back. We finished verse 6 last week. I'll start back in verse 7, chapter 1 of Philippians Sunday morning. If you've got children, uh, Brother Mike Tomlin's teaching the boys, Miss Joanne's teaching the girls, and Miss Cindy's teaching the smaller ones, right? Miss Cindy got the smaller ones, so we're trying to cover everything we can, so be here, and then be here for the service. It's Mother's Day. Uh, you know, uh, how many of you, mother is still alive? One, two, three, four, five. Okay. How many of his mother is not alive? Hard to live with still, ain't it? It's always hard to live with. I don't care what anybody says. It always is. Well, let's stand for a word of prayer and we'll be dismissed. Don't forget your M&Ms, your quarters, $19.50. $20 if you tape the top. And a $20 bill will fit in there with the $19. Amen? You got me now? $20, yeah, if you got, if you don't know, Chris, you don't know what we're doing, we're filling M&Ms up with quarters. And we're putting, we're giving all the missions. Our Sunday school class, so you can take one with you if you want to and try to fill them up. We figured up that we fill 40 of them up a month. That's $800 a month. That's almost half of our missions. And that's just to start. Amen? We're going to do more than that. Somebody say amen. Okay? Let's have a word of prayer. And uh, have we prayed yet? No, thank you, Lord. Brother John Heard, I love you. I want to just tell you that, Brother John. It's been a blessing being your pastor all these years. It's a blessing that you love me, you love this church. It's a blessing. I appreciate you. And you're always in my corner. I appreciate that, amen. Brother John, pray for us.